This is Jeff Weiss with uh, part two of unit 12, uh, sustainable landscaping, uh, materials that are not uh, found on the enter system. Um, but I hope uh, you'll get something out of uh, some more um, contemporary and sustainable practices that are making their way into um, the landscaping industry. Uh, fostered by organizations like the uh, Mila organization and uh, um, other other movements uh, designed to uh, achieve some environmental objectives along with the uh, uh, aesthetic uh, objectives that have always been uh, at the heart of landscaping. So um, just to kind of repeat your uh, assignment 11-12 uh, will be due at the end of assignment 12 and uh, we're getting toward the end of this course here uh, there's just a couple of remaining topics uh, food production horticultural specialties and uh, careers in horticulture and uh, your projects and assignments are going to be due soon so we'll get going on those talked about the learning objectives in the prior um, lecture and there's some new key terms and concepts here that we'll be talking about as we uh, move through this assignment. So for our purposes uh, sustainable landscape are those that give consideration to conservation of water, soil, plants, uh, native plants and other resources uh, a lot of this uh, is inspired by the land ethic as described by Aldo Leopold in the Sand County Almanac and I urge you to pick up a copy and uh, um, try to get at this idea of a land ethic where um, uh, we are recognizing that our future depends on the care that we take of our uh, land resources and to take that as an ethical responsibility. Uh, and these, uh, this land ethic uh, uh, includes, as I mentioned, water conservation, soil conservation, uh, use of indigenous or hardy non-invasive plants, and minimal use of chemical uh, pesticides and fertilizers. Um, but the important um, element of this for um, horticulture is that is the use of plants to mitigate uh, urban and uh, uh, urban environmental issues and there's uh, a lot of uh, work that's been done and uh, steps that can be taken to accomplish that goal. So some of the water issues are conservation, uh, reduced uh, inputs of, uh, of irrigation water through a practice called xeriscaping. So that is the issue of um, too little water, uh, which occurs frequently in the Midwest during our hot summer months and uh, during droughts such as we had in 2012. And then the opposite problem uh, occurs when we get uh, too much water. And in 2013, we had two storms that qualified as 100-year storms, uh, one in April and one in June. And the issue then is using landscape to landscaping principles to um, reduce the harmful effects of those heavy uh, storms, flooding, erosion, sedimentation, um, uh, washing pollutants into our uh, uh, fresh water, and uh, uh, trying to provide uh, healthy, balanced ecosystems in our uh, few remaining natural areas. Collectively, these concepts uh, are called green infrastructure, and we're going to talk about uh, some of them in some detail. But first, uh, I want to talk about a subject that's near and dear to me, and that is uh, uh, a watershed. So a watershed is all of the area in which a um, given uh, a rainfall will accumulate and um, uh, carry water to a common uh, point. So in this uh, illustration um, the watershed is the area within the, uh, 
the ridges on both sides uh, going up to the top of this little valley and then discharging at the river mouth. And every one of us uh, lives in a watershed. I happen to live in the uh, Buffalo Creek watershed uh, which is uh, between uh, uh, southern Lake County and northern Cook County and I started a, a watershed group to address these problems of flooding, erosion, sedimentation, uh, habitat loss, and uh, 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 clean water. And uh, this uh, paragraph here explains what watershed management is about um, and certainly uh, what happens in everyone's yards, in our uh, parks, in our uh, streets, parking lots, uh, malls, uh, schools uh, contributes to either the problem or the solution to the problems that occur in uh, urban suburban watersheds. So historically um, the idea of suburban development has been to take rainwater and to channel it out of the area as quickly as possible. The belief was that we could reduce uh, flooding by moving water out of our subdivisions and uh, neighborhoods. Um, the problem is, uh, several problems with that are that we uh, create a uh, situation where um, the uh, ability of these uh, streams and storm systems are overwhelmed uh, by um, the amount of impervious surfaces. So when we take um, areas that were once prairie areas uh, full of potholes and wetlands and pave them over and turn them into driveways, parking lots, etc., uh, we totally change the ability of the soil uh, and the plants growing in the soil to uh, accept and uh, uh, allow that rainwater to infiltrate in, into the soil. Um, and uh, instead, um, flooding and these other problems are dramatically uh, increased. So, um, along with civilization, uh, we've straightened streams, um, uh, created all these impervious surfaces, and uh, increased flooding, uh, increased pollution, uh, and uh, uh, loss of uh, habitats are the result. So uh, some of the uh, green infrastructure concepts that are now coming in to address these issues include things like in this photograph uh, 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 re-meandering streams that is uh, putting the curves and twists and turns back in. Um, you see on the upper right hand side where a stream was channelized, straightened uh, to run through old farmland and uh, uh, many of our urban streams are totally channelized and that results in a uh, situation where they are um, severe erosion occurs as the stream cuts through the channel and uh, uh, also once the stream uh, gets out of the bank, then the flooding uh, problems are um, are only increased. So the idea of this re-meandering is to uh, um, slow the stream flow down uh, and allow native plants to grow back on the shorelines and in the buffer areas to provide their uh, natural uh, uh, services of absorbing rainwater into their roots, uh, slowing stream flow, and allowing water into to infiltrate into the ground and to be released into the uh, atmosphere through uh, transpiration. A uh, number of projects uh, like this have been uh, undertaken recently. Uh, a big one in uh, uh, McHenry County is the Nipperson Creek project. Uh, but one quite near my home uh, involves Indian Creek at the uh, Heron Creek Forest Preserve, uh, Lake County Forest Preserve, and these are both really nice examples of uh, green infrastructure and have uh, uh, grown in to support uh, uh, nice populations of, uh, of, of waterfall uh, and uh, uh, wetland and, and riparian stream, stream bank plantings. 
So these uh, wetlands and uh, stream uh, corridors uh, uh, provide the ability to store excess water and act as a sponge for gradual release rather than sudden release of water into the uh, freshwater stream systems. Uh, precipitation uh, and runoff uh, are held and uh, rather than causing flooding are slowly released uh, into the soil and uh, um, cause much less uh, uh, flooding and erosion damage. So wetland plants are really the key um, ingredient for these uh, uh, projects to work and this chart, uh, I don't know how well you can make it out, but this chart illustrates the different kinds of plants that grow in different levels in relation to a wetland or a stream profile. Uh, first are the, um, the aquatic plants that grow, that are rooted in the water. Um, the uh, emergent wetland plants uh, that uh, have their roots in the water but uh, grow out of, uh, of, of the water. Um, the emergent wetland plants uh, giving way to wet meadow plants that are water tolerant uh, but grow in the uh, usually dry soil. Uh, and again, moving further up slope, um, there's the uh, scrub shrub uh, wetland layer uh, moving up to uh, a forested wetland. And uh, these uh, forested wetlands or uh, uh, flatwoods are um, uh, a rare um, habitat now, but very important for um, processing rainwater. And then finally, once uh, you move out of the f flood plain, then you have a, 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 another um, vegetation type called up, upland buffer. And uh, in our native habitats, each one of these uh, uh, areas as you grow up the um, uh, up the profile from uh, underwater to uh, dry habitats have their own distinct uh, native plants and uh, many of these have largely vanished from the area due to the uh, degradation caused by our uh, poor handling of stormwater. So that's uh, what happens in a natural area. Now in our yards uh, we can uh, improve um, uh, stormwater management by taking um, uh, steps that involve using some of these same uh, native plants. And uh, uh, rain gardens and bioswales uh, are, free, are more and more frequently being used in, um, in landscaping and they provide the same benefits described, uh, promoting uh, uh, biodiverse uh, healthy ecosystems that uh, uh, provide food and cover for uh, some of our native uh, pollinators and animals such as butterflies, bees, um, dragonflies, birds, and also uh, uh, provide uh, uh, pollination so that our uh, native areas can exchange uh, uh, genetic material um, and uh, continue to survive in more and more fragmented, smaller, increasingly smaller, isolated areas. So uh, these um, rain gardens can uh, increase the ability of uh, plant uh, genes to move back and forth between um, uh, these small, isolated natural areas and provide uh, wildlife corridors for the butterflies, uh, bees and other insects that uh, depend on these plants. So there's a number of um, uh, uh, books and sources available for installing rain gardens and bioswales um, and uh, increasingly some of the landscapers are um, specializing in uh, this kind of work and in uh, using native plants in their um, uh, in their projects. So here's a, a chart of a bioswale um, and uh, there's a great example of a bio of uh, this um,
type of work at um, Ryerson Ryerson Woods. It's a Lake County Forest Preserve. Um, it uses uh, permeable paving uh, and bioswales to um, dramatically reduce the amount of stormwater being released into the uh, nearby Des Plaines River. And it is a, a LEED certified building and, uh, and grounds. And I urge you to visit if you're interested in these, uh, in these concepts. Now moving to xeriscaping. Uh, xeriscaping, as I mentioned, refers to landscaping in ways that reduce or eliminate the need for supplemental irrigation. Um, and it relies on plants whose natural uh, requirements are appropriate to the local climate. And care is taken to avoid losing water to evaporation and runoff. So uh, many of our prairie plants, uh, because their deep rooting systems, are perfectly adapted to, for use as xeriscaping plants. Uh, they both absorb water during the rainy season, uh, usually in spring and fall, and they can use those uh, the water that they've stored in their deep root, root systems to m absolutely minimize or eliminate the amount of irrigation needed during the uh, hot, dry summer months. And here is another photo of a xeriscape uh, uh, approach to landscaping. Uh, notice that the mulch is uh, used also to reduce the amount of uh, evaporation from the soil. Yet another. I believe this uh, scene is from the Chicago Botanic Garden. And then along with uh, um, uh, xeriscaping, uh, uh, water conservation strategies both uh, reduces the amount of, of runoff and conserves water for um, planting in uh, or, or for irrigating uh, garden plants. Uh, so rain barrels and cisterns uh, for storing water coming off of our roofs are, are a couple of the methods uh, used for this type of water conservation. So in addition to conserving and protecting the water, uh, there's a whole range of issues uh, with what's happening to our soil. We're going to get into some more of these uh, when we talk about organic and sustainable uh, horticulture. Um, but suffice it to say that in our landscaping, uh, there are um, steps that we can take um, to stabilize shorelines and stream, stream banks. Uh, and uh, to uh, manage sediment uh, in or that will uh, reduce the impacts from uh, erosion and stream pollution. So sediment is the material that's picked up during erosion and settles out. So anything that's eroded out of our um, out of our uh, off of our land or our, our our stream banks is carried some distance downstream and gets deposited. And uh, why is it bad? Well, it indicates erosion, and uh, frequently these sediments carry the same pollutants that are in the water. Uh, excessive layers of chlorides from road salt, uh, of nitrogen and phosphorus from the fertilizers that get added, uh, and they can uh, compromise water quality and disrupt water flow. Uh, plants, again, play this uh, important role of uh, protecting uh, soil from erosion and uh, uh, again uh, along different zones away from the stream and up the floodplain uh, different kinds of plants uh, need to be um, uh, uh, planted in order to survive and perform these uh, these important roles so the impact on water quality uh, is uh, dramatic and uh, plants in addition to uh, uh, capturing and storing water do filter out these uh, nutrients and pollutants in the water um, and they do so much more effectively than any of our sewage treatment or other uh, uh, water purification methods do. In fact uh, um, the most modern and current uh, uh, practices for um, wastewater treatment involve using plants to as the final uh, uh, 
uh, purification step before the water is released into back into uh, uh, into the system. So a um, uh, list of the environmental services contributed by plants are uh, uh, they certainly uh, take in uh, carbon dioxide and release uh, uh, oxygen to uh, uh, reduce and reverse the effects of global warming. Uh, they mitigate temperatures, uh, cool things off in the uh, summertime. Um, they provide course all the food ultimately that we eat even when we're um, uh, meat eaters all of the uh, uh, meat ultimately comes from plant sources uh, they create the soil through their roots they protect the soil from erosion uh, they filter out and store water in their roots and they provide ha uh, habitat for all of the other uh, uh, all of our uh, animals and wildlife uh, resources. So um, another slide uh, talking about the liv livable environment on our planet is entirely due to plants. Um, without plants there would be no other life. Um, photosynthesis provides oxygen and creates usable food. Uh, it uh, takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and puts it into the vegetation both above ground vegetation and trees where it's stored in trunks uh, and woody tissue and below ground where it's stored in roots. Some studies have indicated that there's as much uh, or more carbon stored in prairies uh, underground than there is in woods, uh, forests, above ground. So plants uh, are the front line in the uh, battle against uh, um, uh, the uh, increased levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the global warming that's occurring as a result of that. So that is uh, there's some more only green plants have the ability to transfer sunlight into sugars and provide food for animals. Carbon dioxide to oxygen. And as long as we are continuing to put carbon into the atmosphere through our use of fossil fuels, uh, we increase carbon dioxide levels. Plants are the answer and uh, vegetative cover provides a key role in creating the biomass and the corresponding uh, ability to take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into plant tissue. So there's quite a bit more on sustainable landscaping. We could get into habitat gardens, edible landscapes, phytoremediation, that is uh, the ability to take chemicals, uh, harmful chemicals out of soil um, and um, have them taken up by plants, use of green roofs, living walls, but we're not going to get to it all this lecture uh, and it's going to be up to you and other future green professionals to uh, um, continue to promote and implement these uh, ideas and uh, try to get some traction against the serious problems of water, air, and soil pollution that are um, threatening our, our uh, uh, most important resources around the world. So we already talked about turf. I'm not going to go back there, but that is my uh, lecture on sustainable landscapes. And uh, let me know if you have any questions and uh, be very, very happy to uh, um, welcome any of you who are interested into our uh, uh, Buffalo Creek Clean Water Partnership group or give you any inf additional information about uh, sustainable practices. So that's it for uh, Unit 12 and uh, talk to you again soon.